So if you want to vote on which um, which strategy uh, or which tooling do you use for strategy, uh, mostly, and you have three votes. So we're starting now. So the votes on, are in. OKRs, 14 votes. You can see it for yourself. What's being used for strategy? It's interesting to see that there's quite a lot of OKRs, so I guess quite a lot of Agilist amongst us. And SWOT diagrams, as well as customer journeys. Uh, and it's nice to see eight people uh, answering uh, worldly maps. And I see some people cons I'm bringing Zone to Win, uh, which is a great book uh, by Jeffrey Moore. Thank you. So that's that's to put us in the mood. Uh, we are we are using you know SWOT diagrams and OKRs as per the title of this session, uh, are, are mostly being used, and uh, we're going to look uh, at what the world maps can actually uh, bring um, in addition to this. So let me share my screen now and. We're gonna get started. Johan, what is this about New York? Yeah, what's going on in New York? So about a hundred years ago, or I guess actually 120 years ago exactly. Well, this was in May. You had the the May parade on Fifth Avenue, and uh, the same thing happened uh, ten years later. Same place, same city, but the pictures are very different. So. Uh, to the left, we have, well, do we have any suggestions in the chat for what's what's going on? What's the difference between these two pictures? I'll give you five seconds to answer it in the, in the chat. Industrial revolution. Industrial revolution. There's lots of horse. There's horses to the left and there's horsepower to the right. Cars took over. Yeah, viewpoint is also, one is closer to the street. That's a good a good point. So yeah, in 10 years, the whole horse bug industry, more or less in, uh, in uh, New York City, died. The last horse-drawn streetcar was actually active till sometime 1930, but essentially dead. So and this just shows how quickly disruption can happen in this world. So, and it's happening as we speak right now in all kinds of businesses. So we are trying to get a feeling for the participants here. So we would like you, if your company is a horse buggy business, i.e. about to be disrupted, probably, we, give you, we would like you to give a thumbs down as an emote in your window. And uh, if you are a car business that is running away with whatever revolution is going on, uh, we want you to give you a, a thumbs up. So give it a go right now. Find a reaction and give a thumbs up. We have at least one car company, another car company. Lots of, lots of car companies. So a Ferrari yeah, even. It's a Ferrari even. There you go. Uh, that's what we like to see. So that's great. It, it, we're very happy for you. But it turns out... Uh, Philip, that being a car company is no guarantee for success either, because uh, around this time when we see the picture uh, in 1913, we had a lot of car companies in the US. And uh, uh, just a few short decades later, there were a lot fewer of them. And uh, as we move on into our time, there's only really three. Of course, the industry itself is a lot bigger, but the companies have not survived. They've either been taken over or gone bankrupt. The only new car manufacturer is, of course, Tesla. And we'll go back to the car industry in a while. So, uh, Philip, given that we have this sort of quite fierce competition in new fields, strategy is needed. And obviously, if you're a horse buggy manufacturer, you're going to need some sort of strategy as well because you want survival. But if we look at the type of strategies we're taught and that were shown and that are taughted by uh, different companies, I guess we shouldn't name names, but you have a one of them is linked here. A lot of it is kind of straightforward and easy. And uh, 
it's doubtful that it's actually going to make a difference for you. So here's an example for facing the digital revolution in uh, manufacturing and in the industrials, uh, where they say that the strategy is to place the customer at the center of solution innovation. We need to build the right talent when the things are changing, and we need to focus and make digital important to us. And it's like, yes, uh, there's no alternative to these things. You have to do these things. But no one is going to not try and do it. So hence, is it even a strategy? So we need to do more than this. And this is kind of repeated across the board. And uh, when you see strategies, from, especially from large companies, it's sort of this blah of, <laughs> of words where, uh, of course, they need to carry all these things out, but it's never going to separate them from competition. So Vodafone, which is the case, this case here, is not going to run away from Orange by doing the things that are on this list. So BLAS is just short for business level abstractions of healthy strategies, i.e. corporate buzzwords, which we can actually automatically generate if we want and probably be as good off as we would if we hired a large consultancy. So uh, automatically generated, here's an example. So uh, our strategy is customer focused, rings a bell from a few slides ago. We'll lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. By being both digital first and agile, our open approach will drive efficiency throughout the organization. So all good stuff, but it's pretty unclear whether this is going to set us apart from organization, and, uh, from and our if, competition. And if that kind of strategy ticks in your business, you know, you can get it for free, a strategy as a service at this uh, URL. And we'll share the PDF afterwards, so uh, you can access that. But so we're going to do better than that today. We're at least going to try, right? So uh, <laughs> if we move further, so why is it that all these strategies or these examples that we've shown, at least, why are they so blah, Philippe? And the challenge um, that we see is that we tend to, to see strategy as a bit of a straight line between problem opportunities and solutions. And you know, we, we have this SWOT diagram, and you mentioned earlier that um, SWOT diagram was actually something very much in use uh, in, the, in, in, in your work uh, or in your ways of doing strategy. And I am not sure that we get to the level of depth so if, if we were to do a quick exercise now, I'm going to set up some, um, some uh, breakout rooms and we're going to add back uh, to um, the Miro board. And what we'll do uh, is uh, we're going to be you know, setting a breakout. There's quite a few people here. So we'll probably set a breakout of six people or so. Uh, and in your breakout, if you want to choose a car company, and, and we give you a, a few choices between Porsche and you know, Volkswagen, Toyota, Tesla, and Ford. And uh, with those, if you want to start filling a SWOT diagram, and we give you about 15 minutes in your small group, if you want to fill a SWOT diagram, and from that insight, uh, on the next board along, um, and if I share my screen, you, you see a couple of boards that um, we're running. Um, on the next board along, uh, on those 15 minutes, and we'll give you a, a bit of a shout out uh, at um, five minutes before the end. Uh, if you want to capture for that, uh, that brand, what would be your strategy with the insight of your um, of your SWOT. So thank you, thank you all for for participating to this. And of course, you know it's difficult to do you know such complex strategy in 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 automotive in you know fifteen minutes. Uh, but we will send we will send all all those details uh, to to the relevant manufacturers. So so your efforts are, are worthwhile. Um, but um, <clears throat> joke apart, um, you know, I hope the, the SWOT gave you a good sense to start with and, and then, you know, you were able to, to articulate some choices. 
and SWATs uh, are, are great uh, in a way to support the articulation of problems and opportunities. Uh, and they do fairly well at combining this external view and internal view. And sometimes the internal view is uh, we've got limitations, we've got challenges, and they need to be part of the strategy. And SWATs are pretty good at that. Now, uh, and you may have experience um, that sometimes the solution you know, become too basic or obvious, even sometimes made up from some, some ideas, we preconceived ideas we already have. Uh, and, 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 and that's what makes a choice. And the worst part of it is sometimes the SWOT becomes a justification of choices we've already made. And it's not unusual to see that. So what, what can we do better? Uh, and, and some of you would probably say, uh, well, of course, and, and, and quite, a few use, quite a few of you use OKRs, so of course we should use OKRs instead of SWATs. Uh, but is that really the answer? Uh, and if we, for those that don't know OKRs, uh, it's the idea of objective and key results. It's been really popularized by, by Google. Um, and uh, the objective is this intended outcome and the key result is pretty much, are you pacing yourself to get there? And um, the, the thing about OKRs is they bring this team agency in a way. They don't, you know, they're not prescriptive so much that people just deliver, uh, but they, they have this idea that the team will figure, how do we get to those objectives? Um, and it's really difficult to do that right. Uh, you know, pitching the OKRs right is a difficult thing. Um, the interesting thing also about OKRs is you may start from the key results. So we need that level of availability. And then you work out the strategies to, to get there. And or equally, you can say, you know, we need to improve the team resilience. And then we can think, OK, how are we going to measure that? And that relationship between measures and strategy is, is in itself quite generative uh, into opening things. And that's why uh, OKRs are actually interesting uh, at team level uh, to reveal you know, possibilities, uh, but only as long as you really balance your strategies and your key results, so objective key results, and, and you reflect uh, between the two uh, iteratively. Now, OKRs interesting is uh, they, they, they bring that generative thinking between strategies and measures. Uh, and they also offer, and OKRs are very much also linked into the strategy deployment space, and they offer a good uh, deployment uh, option and, and to, to, to track the progress of strategies. Uh, but they tend to be solution-led, and they don't necessarily surface the problems of the organization and the limitations you may have very well. So that means all the strategy can become uh, wishful. Uh, and of course, when we say this, we talk in broad terms, you know, of course, if you have geniuses of that, they, they will get it right. Uh, but in the broad terms for everybody, for collaboration at a large scale, uh, they tend to, to, to show the destination, but not really acknowledge so many of the problems uh, on the ground. And as a result, it can become wishful. Um, and, and, and it doesn't really balance so much the outside in perspective and the inside out. And what we mean by that is the business strategy, the, the strategy that sort of uh, the market commands for the, for the business is, is more referred to as the outside in strategy. And the inside out is how do we need to organize inside? How do we need to flow the work? How do we need to um, create innovation inside? to actually um, deliver uh, to the outside in, to deliver in the market. And that balance is not completely clear, whereas the, the SWOTs was a bit clearer about it. So the question is, are they uh, alone? You know, they probably won't cut it. And, and, and generally, you need a balance of a number of things. And is there, is there more that can be done? Johan, do you want to tell us? Yeah, so we have to understand a broader, have a broader mental image of what's going on when we create strategies. And what we are actually running through when we create strategies, whether they are far down in the organization or doing the, the inside out, 
or if they're sort of a more or less on the top of the company deciding how we move in the market uh, we have to run through the OODA loop and uh, the OODA loop at the sort of very most basic level runs through four phases so observe so we see where we are and what we're, what's going on in the environment we orient ourselves to figure out what are the options for us to move then we decide on an option and then we act and when we act something is going to happen we are going to move somehow the uh, the, the world around us is going to act some it's going to react somehow to what we are doing and then it all goes over and over and over and over again and as you see from this picture there is a lot more to OODA loops than just going through these four phases uh, and we're not going to go into many of the details here we're just going to use this to explain why there's a deficiency in just using SWOTs and OKRs so if we look at the OODA loop and SWOTs it's very much in the observe phase and what you've been doing here is observing and then uh, from that we we jump all across to act and OKRs very very quickly uh, and uh, we do this uh, kind of intuitively uh, so we don't really know how we orient and decide and th that turns into okay we've done this by intuition or maybe we just copied someone else uh, which is not very good if we want to stand out if we want to run away from competition if we want to create innovation and if we want to support collaboration at scale when we create our strategies so that's the problem so a big part of the strategy process or the formulation of strategy is really in the orient and decide uh, phases which we tend to skip over or just do intuitively and and often it's that intuitive sort of effort in between means that you know it's kind of a straight line we go problem to solution and we we sort of lose the meaning meaningfulness of strategies uh, in the middle and and that's where uh, how do we spend more time in that space uh, is actually uh, important and where we're going to look about uh, how the world maps are helping with that so when when the business landscape is changing you know strategy needs to change too and we need both the meaningfulness as well as being able to pivot and 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 work quicker and what we mean by changing is we want less of you know strategy by biases uh, we want less of sort of strategy that becomes wishful and and we just throw all the balls in the air and see actually what lands uh, and and that tends to overload the system um, we we need to be also careful not to be blindsided or political so sometimes you know the strategy is basically people uh, trying to jockey for position and and as a consequence you know they're all pushing things that may not be good for the business but may be good for them um, and also the challenge of strategy by memes so you know the industry is doing agile transformation the industry is going big data right now the industry is in this ai wonderland um, but is that meaningful for you and most importantly uh, we you know strategy tends to be uh, something where people don't feel confident uh, and and we need to restore the confidence of businesses with strategy because that's what matters that's how they drive that's the leadership of the business and and you know instead they tend to try and bring other people that only repeat what their customers the the other people in industry do uh, and as a consequence it's not going to be differentiated so overall we want less of that and uh, for strategy we want more of uh, insightful and suitable to the situation so being able to read the context and what to do with it uh, origination from the ground up so the people doing the work how do they collectively contribute to the strategy um, how do we blend the outside in strategy and inside out if if we're talking about agility if we're talking about a changing landscape the inside out become as important uh, because the content of the strategy what you're going to focus on is going to change so you need to work on your ability to follow the change 
and emerge, you know, uh, bring new thinking into the party, into the strategy, uh, and into contributions, so you can know what to change for. Um, and then, you know, the aspects of that collective engagement, the awareness of the environment, and being agile and iterative. And we want more of that. So strategy is in a space of change, uh, and uh, part of you know using maps is to have that better insight but also the collaboration that goes around strategy, it becomes a tool for collaboration. So how do we do that? How about world maps? So, uh, and I appreciate maybe uh, we may not very clearly show, show hands, but if you can use the emoticon and give us a sum up, if, if you are familiar with world maps, and let's say to the point of, you kind of able to do a map. More than hearing about it, but doing a map. Okay. And I see Rajani, you got to uh, end raised. Is that for a question or is that for- No, to say that I have used Wadley maps before. Okay. So we got quite a few people that have, thank you very much. So just a, a very, very quick rush course. And there's a lot more to mapping. But just for you to be able to understand and follow, we have uh, really a few points here about understanding maps. So on maps, the first thing is space has a meaning, and that's why there are maps. You know, we, we call a number of things like um, mind maps and, and, and architecture maps, uh, things that tend to be more diagrams, because where it is positioned on the paper doesn't really matter. With maps, the space has a meaning. So the vertical space is around visibility, which is not as important uh, as, as the horizontal space, but it allows you to organize things and it's visibility to the user of the map. So whoever is going to consume uh, the services, so whoever has needs on the map is going to actually see how their needs are being met. And at some point it doesn't matter. It's underneath the bonnet you know do you know what type of injectors have you got in your car uh, if you're a car enthusiast maybe but most of the people uh, don't really mind uh, what is there so that's where it becomes lower and lower levels and and you care about what it does for you but not necessarily what it is itself um and there is uh, so that level of mobi uh, visibility and then there's the movement which is very important the movement is everything travels uh, between genesis a space of wonder something is new um, and by nature of uh, demand and competition things travel to the right typically so it goes from genesis to something custom built product and commodity and, I, and i'll explain in a second what it's about um, so if you think about Genesis, we're inventing something new, we're experimenting. It's a, a space, and, and as Johan was showing, in the early days of, of car making, there was over 400 manufacturers. It's a bubbling space, a lot is happening. And over time, you know, only so many are gonna survive across their chasm to actually finding clients uh, who they're gonna sell to. And uh, the custom built is really you find clients and you try and sell or, or make what you're selling. So it's very much around, you know, customer driven. We're testing the market still. We have a few clients that are interested and we're starting to narrow down what our proposition is. And over time, you know, you go into a consolidating into a product. And here there's an inertia because you love clients talk, asking you something, and at some point you have to say, hmm, no, this is what the product is. And now we are selling what we make. And it's a very big step in many organizations to do that. And there's this inertia to evolve all the time. Uh, and you could say, you know, sometimes you don't go through those phases. Sometimes you're a fast follower, fast agile follower, and you're gonna enter the market when the market is more mature, but in that case, you need to be watching weak signals. So what telling you where the market is at, what's hot in the market and when to enter. Uh, and then, you know, with the continued uh, adoption, 
uh, becoming more and more common, uh, you, you will see that you look to scale and you become a platform, a utility, and the price starts to be the thing that matters. And everything through a value chain, so through the elements that constitute your product or service, is evolving according to this. Now, when that happens, and when there are more sort of foundations in place, it enables new order items, new possibilities, new innovation. And there's continually that, uh, that basically commoditization, if you want, journey, where you go from Genesis, custom build product, commodity, and then it roots back into creating new possibilities of innovation. And that's the dynamics of a map. And it happens all the way through basically what constitute value chains. And, and we'll explain value chains in a sec uh, with Johan. Um, so Johan, do you want to tell us about that cup of coffee? And I insist on the cup of coffee because I'm French. I'm not as much of a tea drinker. And uh, Simon explained this with the tea, but I think there's a lot of value yeah. in coffee. We're going to do a nice coffee. And uh, before I do that, there's a lot more theory and nuance in the uh, in the Genesis custom built product and commodity axis here. Uh, so you can study that for a month uh, if you want. But what we're trying to do here is, is to explain it in general so you can understand and read a map uh, at a first attempt. Uh, that being said, so if we look at a cup of coffee, what does a map for a cup of coffee look like? So we have a user who wants a nice cup of coffee. And if, if, if it is to be nice, at least in the past, you had to have a barista that made it for you with craft and care. And he would use artisan coffee and be in a professional cafetiere. I guess that's a French uh, cafe somehow. Absolutely. And uh, in that cafe, he would use commodity things such as power and water to make that coffee. Now, since nice coffee is really something that people want, there's a strong demand for it. Uh, there's going to be uh, competition and there's going to be innovation that's going to drive us to other forms of consumption. So all of a sudden we have convenience uh, and then we don't go to the barista anymore. We get a machine. Uh, in this case, it's a Nespresso machine. So uh, they have this very, they used to have very exclusive uh, Grand Cru capsules. Uh, again, again think. very French, this uh, this coffee making. Uh, that you have in a very special, in a relatively specialized home coffee machine that was specifically made for Nespresso. And again, uses power and water. And that was very popular. Uh, George Clooney made it happen for Nestle, I guess. Uh, so that's been uh, expanded and innovated over time into the commodity space because now you can get very generic capsules uh, with the same result as a Nespresso, more or less. And you have home machines that are standardized for specific capsule formats that are not closed source uh, as they used to be. Uh, but they're still, still using power and water. So this is the visualization of uh, time in an industry around coffee and and you can see the the, the verticality is what you would see uh, of of your value chain and and how the vertical things connect is what we call a value chain and and the red arrows was how things over time are evolving and you know from what was you know these artists and things through the, the need for convenience and bringing this at home then things are evolving to the right, uh, where it's it's more repeatable and 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 more sort of standardized in a way. And everything evolves that way. Good. Shall we make a pause and see if we have any questions so far? I so think now it's uh, going to be time to our our friends from the Wardley mapping community has been very helpful in answering questions here in the chat. It's been uh, it's been high activity. I also wrote in a little bit there, but I uh, think Joaquin and uh, Tristan and others have been very helpful. Good. Uh, anybody has questions? And I don't really have time to watch the chat as as we are progressing through through this talk. So. Uh, any questions and if you want to raise hand and we can we can address those and and then we're going to go into 
the serious case of the automotive industry. So it would be time to fasten the seat belts, so to speak. So we have one question about why didn't the nice cup of coffee move to the right? Uh, and arguably, uh, it should move to the right, uh, maybe at least to the product stage. Um, yeah. yeah, that's true. The the thing is, um, we on on the user needs, and of course, we try and align them uh, to 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 the map. But the user needs tends to be the user needs. That's the starting point. Uh, you align them for convenience of reading a map and, and so it doesn't get too messy. Uh, but the strict adherence of uh, where those things belong is probably not as uh, essential on the user needs. But uh, you, you're right that uh, it becomes uh, somehow a product or a commodity over time. Yeah. And uh, there are versions of maps where you add sort of what, what your certainty of the user need is, where if the user need is in the commodity space, it's something that you must have, otherwise no one will ever buy it. So probably uh, you want the, the coffee to be liquid for you to drink it, sort of, mm -hmm. all the way to it's just a bet. You have no idea whether it's going to work or not, or whether this is an actual need and it's in, in Genesis. So there's all kinds of things you can do there on the need side. Absolutely. Let's go to cars, shall we? Let's go to the cars. So here we're going to walk through a more complex map uh, and it is it is going to open up quite a bit. So uh, and please, please try and follow because um, once you have the final map, we will ask you uh, and we would do breakouts to um, to figure what kind of strategic choices you would make that would be different. So if we start with a, a user of a car and what is probably driving the, the interest in the car is personal mobility uh, and, and often right now is through car ownership. And to support that, you know, you, you tend to have finance uh, because cars are expensive things, uh, probably just second to houses uh, and, and it supports the finance industry to fund them. Uh, people are, are probably also interested in um, the economy uh, and it is down to this engine uh, and the engine uh, itself uh, or the, the ICE, so internal combustion engine cars, um, would um, use a gas tank and uh, fuel stations to refill it. Uh, and then there's an aspect of status. And of course, you know, there's going to be more on this map, but the automotive industry is extremely complex, so there will be a lot more to explore on maps. But this is for the purpose of the exercise. So here, you know, status is also important uh, with the brand that you're buying, uh, aspects of luxury uh, in, in, in that status, so you know, the finish of the car and the quality. Um, and performance is also interesting uh, and was probably more relevant, and we'll see that on this map. Um, in you know quite quite a couple of decades ago, uh, and uh, that's driven by the brake horse power, so the, the power of the car and uh, of of the the engine. Um, and if we go you know further, uh, there's this also aspect of safety, uh, and safety uh, is is addressed with let's say airbags and and things we have grown completely used. We probably don't even think whether the car is an airbag when we buy it anymore. We take it for granted. And we're seeing uh, some active systems, uh, active um, security systems, like the car will break if you're about to have an accident and, and all those sort of things growing uh, now. Do you want to carry on on this one, Johan? Yeah, so, and then there's this aspect of responsibility and compliance, which is a relatively less mature need, which is probably one of the younger needs in, in cars, where we are starting to care or have been caring for a certain, for time, I'd say about clean emissions, uh, and the economy to have these clean emissions, or it's, it's kind of <clears throat> connected together because if you have if you don't uh, emit a lot of emissions it's probably because the engine is smaller and the car is cheaper 
And of course that changed now with a lot more options on the drive trains that, and by drive train, we, we all, all the, the car is propelled forward. Uh, and we're talking about the internal combustion engine, but we're seeing the hybrids uh, and, you know, Toyota has been out with the Prius for quite some time now, um, allowing the balance of a, a battery operated vehicle and, um, and an internal combustion engine. Uh, and then we have the BEVs, so the batteries, electric vehicles, so only powered on battery and uh, H2 is hydrogen. So the, the sort of um, hydrogen powered, whether the cell, cell based um, cell, um, how do you call it? Fuel cell. Fuel cell, sorry. Fuel cell based or, or, or combustion, uh, but hydrogen being cleaner uh, when it combusts. So that that's that's a big, big change here. And that opens to further change. Do you want to tell us about that storage? Joan? Yeah. So, I mean, when we had internal combustion engines, the storage, the energy storage is just a gas tank which is, if you can't think of something more mature that is sold in the market today, it's almost difficult because when you buy the car, you might think about the size of the gas tank or you'd be very annoyed if the gas tank was extremely small. But for the most part, it doesn't play a role when you buy a vehicle. Uh, whereas now for batteries, it's starting to become uh, much more important. And we have lithium ion uh, batteries that are very mature. There are gigafactories built all over the, the world for lithium ion uh, fuel cells, oh, sorry, for lithium ion, lithium ion cells that are dominating the car market by miles. But at the same time, we see lots of talk uh, from Toyota about solid state batteries that are going to come and really upend performance in battery packs. Uh, for for battery electric vehicles. So there's a lot happening there in both the commoditization of lithium ion and in these new innovations uh, in that battery space. And then for her, for H2, it's okay, there's some sort of pressure tank or uh, it's not completely solved exactly how that's going to work. There are cars that run on H2 and those are just very high pressure gas tanks. But if that's going to be a, a very widely spread technology, uh, that's something to consider whether it's solved or not, or maybe there needs to be invention there. And then the same thing goes for energy refill, of course, which is something we really did not consider, let's say, 15 years ago, because the only, re the only thing you would ever do is to go to a fuel station and fill up your gas tank. All of a sudden, we are thinking a lot about uh, how we're going to charge our electric vehicle. And in terms of the distribution of, of um, hydrogen, there really isn't a solution out there. Uh, would you like to add something on the refill side, uh, Philippe? And I've simplified it a little bit here. And so people might comment that, you know, maybe the solid state would, will join directly to, to the charging and so on. But it was making the, the map really a bit messy. So apologies if it's not completely precise, but... Uh, that was for simplicity of, of reading. Uh, and here, what's interesting is the public charging is actually, and if you think about Tesla, uh, the public charging is still uh, relatively custom. You know, I, I hope I have an, an EV and um, to, to get charging, it's, it's hit and miss sometimes. Uh, and, and what is the success of Tesla is, is probably also the superchargers. And people know that there is superchargers and, and their sat-nav guides them to superchargers and they can rely on that. And you know, if you think about how would you buy a car before, you would really care about the top level of the value chain. And now we are really starting to care on the deep, deep down on the value chain where we took those things completely for granted. So it's an interesting dynamic in the market and, and doing the map as well, a lot is entangled, a lot is entangled and, and a lot is potentially in opposition, uh, which makes it really difficult to make choices. So the next thing is the range, of course, everybody talks about the range uh, and that becomes 
um, actually something to, you know, that is linked to the storage. So how big is the battery? How, how efficient is the car? Uh, and the solid state battery uh, are kind of looked at to, to solve that. But it's also, you know, in, in sequence linked to the charging. Uh, and you may not need, and when I say things are kind of in opposition and balancing each other is you may, if you had a really great charging infrastructure, you may not need and rely so much on the energy storage. So maybe, you know, there could be a link here to the refill as well. And, and what to worry about is, you know, as we said, the personal mobility, now we care about items that deep down the value chain that before wouldn't have been a second thought, whether we had the petrol station for our gas tank car. Um, now we care a lot more about how we're gonna refill the car and how much can it store. So there are some questions in the chat. Uh, let me uh, let me just read them. We have one question. Um, uh, talking about simplicity, isn't this showing also the limit of this method? If we can represent uh, reality accurately with this map, uh, don't we risk to have the same risk as we have with SWOT, where we jump to the obvious conclusions without much thinking about the true complexity of the real world? I mean, that's always a risk, right? But uh, I think the the idea here is that, yes, uh, getting accurate information is, of course, good. But what is going to happen if you run your process with maps is that you're actually going to do much more work in the orientation and clarification of the options available to you. And it's gonna be less intuitive once you learn about uh, some of the other aspects of maps that we're gonna to get to soon. So there's always a risk, but uh, the outcome is probably gonna be better using maps than just a pure SWOT. That's, that's just my personal experience. Uh, uh, ben has a nice answer. The slice of reality you end up uncovering through the, oh, okay, everyone can read that, it's okay. Uh, and is there any relationship between impact we want to achieve and movement of nodes in the map? Given we want to achieve an impact, yeah, there's uh, there's all kinds of things we can do given that, that we have an objective. And we will get to that uh, shortly because we only started with the map. Why is range put in the middle? Uh, it's just a question. So uh, it's our interpretation of reality. So uh, this is us showing you the map and you are free to challenge it. And there might be a closer relationship between the user and range that we just haven't represented in this map. So maybe we should just change it to represent that that's the case. And, and uh, it's, it, yeah. it's, it's a trigger for discussions. The map, and, and I, I love, you know, when, when we train maps, I love showing that slide at the end of it. I know a quote from Simon Wardley saying, all maps are wrong. Uh, and it's something he says, it's an imperfect representation of reality but it helps you making choices. And, and the choices are, if you want, if you, you're not okay with the range being here, is why should it be more to the right? Or why should it be more to the left? And that's what really interest, is interesting, is having that conversation. Because that conversation is what's gonna refine your strategy. And, and it's the power of map compared to other methods that you're not having that conversation with others. And the fine tuning of those positions and then talking into movement uh, is where where strategy really comes to light. So maybe let's go to that next, so that we can. Uh, so I mean, the next is also it's also <laughs> that yeah, indeed, uh, it's also that you know, and I love thinking about what's not on the map, and and especially when we think about what's coming on the left of the map, uh, and uh, there's things like the personal mobility maybe the car ownership is not going to be so relevant anymore and, and we're going to have more on-demand car that can self-drive to your place. And when that becomes possible with the self-driving, uh, we're going to have a lot more potentially of on-demand car. And the self-driving is also interesting as an extension to active, uh, active um, safety systems. Uh, how, how is that going to be uh, playing out? Um, and, and it's still relatively new. And again, if the self-driving and, and, and cars are becoming on long journeys, like a, like a lounge, 
how much on board entertainment is, is that going to open up? How many more strategies around entertainment are going to emerge from within cars? And already you can see that some of the brand, the weak signal of that is Tesla had some games on, on their, their central console or has some games. So when you when you recharge your car, you know, you can play those games. And new other brands are doing that now, whereas many brands were thinking, actually, no, no, we are serious people. We don't do games on our cars. But now they're starting to do that. So th there is also things emerging onto the left of the map that are interesting to see. Um, and that's going to be the map we're going to work with. And of course, there's, there will be a lot more to put on that map. But before we let you go to a quick breakout to figure out what different choices you would make, uh, let's talk about movement. And the first movement and the first question is the clean emission, you know, whether people saw that as a movement, but now you have things like ultra low emission zone. And in London, we have the ULES. Uh, that is basically accelerating the need for change and people changing their cars. Um, and um, that's beating the inertia. So where there would be inertia for people to really make a change here, you know, some policies and decisions may be accelerating that. And, and here it's about the car manufacturer reading what's happening in the market more so than making happen or having a wish that they sell more of that. If this is happening in the market, how do we exploit that? And likewise, the BHP, so the power of the car, is becoming commoditized. You know, it used to be the premise of expensive brand to have a powerful car, but with electric cars, everybody has you know, a high level of power on their car. And the range becoming, on the other hand, is the new order item, the new things people really care about. So interesting dynamics here. Um, do you want to sh talk to us to the solid state, Johan? Yeah, so as I said, there's a lot going on in the energy storage space, um, both in cars and elsewhere, of course. But here you have this uh, new imminent technology coming out. Uh, well, uh, Toyota is promising uh, that it will be here in, when is it, 2026 or something like that, 2028 at least for a small amount of the cars that they can produce, which will completely upend the lithium ion space. Of course, lithium ion is, is a commodity and can be produced in large amounts. So there will be a long time before it's uh, completely out of the picture or at least tens of years. Someone asked about horses here. So this is sort of the horse, <laughs> one of the horse uh, versus uh, car situations on this map. So if that actually works, the range is probably going to go away as a problem because you're going to have similar range to an, an ICE and you're going to be able to charge it a lot faster. So it, that's going to change a lot in this map if that actually happens, because that's not that it's, it's far from certain that that's actually going to work and be rolled out the way they say it's going to happen. And then, of course, the charging is probably going to commoditize relatively fast as we get more and more cars. Uh, hopefully for us consumers, there's going to be consolidation and a commoditization of the, and standardization of exactly how charging is going to happen. Uh, this, it's already happening, but it's going to happen a lot more, most likely. And what we may see bizarre on the map is a fuel station, which is a total commodity, might become a rarity going forward because it's going to get more and more niche. Uh, the people needing fuel. So we, we could see, you know, a, an interesting play around here. Um, and then the next one is on-demand cars. So what happens, and I, I, I was asking that question, you know, when on-demand cars is more convenient than ownership, and, and when that will move all the way across, probably supported by self-driving, and that might be uh, one of the obstacles, but we can already rent cars. And maybe next movements, um, what happened when self-driving is a safer norm and when basically the, uh, the, the self-driving becomes the active security system is not to let a human drive. 
what happens when that happens and when it becomes the norm. Um, and and again, the luxury is the luxury, the next level of luxury, the, the onboard entertainment and, and how your car will become like a lounge. So we started really with a simple map um, and, and now we're getting to something a lot more complex. But hopefully by following the explanation we gave you, you can actually, even if you're not familiar to map, you can make sense of this. And now the question, uh, and we'll do probably a quick five minutes breakout maybe for, for just having a discussion in your breakout. But if you can reflect with the insight of this map, which we put on my role, uh, what would be, and, and revisiting the, the, car, the car you were talking about, what would be your new decisions with the insight of seeing what was going on? What would be the next new decisions you would make uh, for, for your car manufacturers? So let's do a very quick five minutes on that. And I'm, I'm reopening the rooms for it. And then we wrap up, uh, we wrap up our meetup for the day. But I was thinking about how do you make use of this? So within your own organization, would you maybe map out what's already there, both in your own organization and maybe in the industry, and then start thinking about whether you want to focus on you know, getting yourself from where some of the leaders are, from where you are, or stuff that you want to put into Genesis and think about whether that's your strategy. Is that the idea? You know, would if you're in an industry or whatever, like like the car industry, all of this, a lot of this stuff already exists, right? So, so is that it? You try to map out what's so, or, or you or you or you then, play the market. So you understand how things will unfold in the market and how do you ride that? At least don't ride behind the wave, ride with the wave, or can you ride certain things ahead of the wave? And sometimes, are you, are you market making, making, are you creating the wave for it? But of course, all those things you need to appreciate. Uh, it takes a lot more energy sometimes to, 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 and, 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 and longer to get something to get adopted versus some things that are already in movement. Yeah, and I, I think the, an easy answer too is you you try to start mapping where you actually have a challenge and you use it as a problem solving tool for that, and then you learn through that. Uh, and uh, if need be, you you can get uh, help. There's lots of people helping out with facilitation of that, so you get it's much easier to get started that way. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we have we're running out of time, so let's just uh, run through this extremely fast. So there are steps to take to get to a bit more informed decisions from the map. So where we make choices for what to move on the map. So what we said, what we saw before is the things that are moving that we don't have a choice over. Now we want to try and control some of the movement. We want to slow it down or accelerate it or make something new happen. And there's a lot, a lot of patterns uh, for that, all the way from know your users, focus on user needs, same thing that McKinsey was telling us in the slide to extremely quite uh, elaborate patterns um, to exploit that we have a knowledge of maps that others don't. And, uh, and the aspect as well is, are you capable to, to work on your strategy, to deliver to your strategy? And that's what the doctrine here is helping out with, is are you fit to do that? Because sometimes you wish you could, but how many times do I hear People are saying, hey, we have a great strategy, but we're not able to execute it. Yeah. And uh, next, the next step is, of course, to actually, if it was changed slides, is to describe those moves. Uh, and there are num there's a large number of patterns that can be recognized uh, for moves. But this is, uh, you can go from quite simple things to very advanced things, such as the, what you see here, which is innovate, leverage, commoditize which is about uh, when you have a commodity, you can listen to the weak signals in the market where things are consuming your uh, your service. And then you can commoditize the popular things and then just step up the map uh, over time. All right. Of course, um, you know, if you want business agility, it's your ability to flex and pivot your strategy as you move along. And that needs to be based on having signals coming up bottom up 
um, and through harnessing collaborative input, stimulating ideas, organizing coherence and alignment, and balancing the focus and our ability to change course. And all of this requires collaboration, which maps help. Uh, and looking at different uh, sort of levels, you can look at having a number of people uh, mapping across the business and, and ideally with different uh, diverse teams. And from those diverse teams, they can then harness in strategy deployment what they are thinking to go into execution, what, what is getting progressed. Uh, and that's where you bring the idea of a continuous strategy operating model where um, you're getting to map periodically with a number of diverse teams. It feeds a refresh where you think about your strategy, its progress, but what is new coming into it, and then it flows into execution with a lean portfolio management. That's pretty much it. It was intense workshop. I hope you all appreciate it, and we, we're probably happy to stay beyond a few minutes for those that have questions. And and as you're leaving as well, you know, there's um, there's there's a small um, place about how was your experience, what have you learned, what will you do next. Uh, it's it's great if you could uh, fill these fill some ideas on that, and and to let you know as well. Uh, we are looking to bring uh, a course together around optimizing business strategy for fundraising success and industry disruption, probably more focused on startups. So please, please uh, email us uh, to, to register your interest. But we, we are happy to, to take questions now. Uh, 